Hi, everyone, uh, and welcome to the San Antonio Book Festival. Thank you so much for joining us. I can't wait to share with you this panel and the panelists we have, these wonderful books I'll talk more about in just a second. Before we start, I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm Tiffany Yates Martin. I am a uh, book editor, a developmental book editor, and I'm also a author myself under the pseudonym Phoebe Fox. Um, we are going to talk for about an hour. There's going to be time for Q and A's with uh, Ixta Maya Murray and Jen Silverman. We'll tell, we'll find out more about them in just a second. If at any point you guys have questions, please feel free to post them in the, I think the chat or the Q and A. Um, Kristen's going to be monitoring that and we will at, toward the last maybe five, 10 minutes of the program, we'll be able to go in and talk to uh, address some of those questions. Um, our book sponsor is Nowhere Bookshop. It's independent bookstores are having a little bit of a struggle right now during the pandemic. It's great to support them. Nowhere Bookshop is sponsoring the festival. If you hit the buy books button below or on the festival site, you will be able to buy the books on the panel or any of the books that you've fallen in love with during the festival. I'll mention that again as we go on and we'll talk again about Q and A's as we go on. But first, let me go ahead and introduce the panelists because I'm so excited about this session. Um, let me make sure I have them queued up. Ixta Amaya Murray is a novelist, art critic, playwright, and law professor. The author of nine books, her most recent are the story collection, The World Doesn't Work That Way, But It Could, and the novel Art is Everything. She has won a Whiting Award, an Art Writers Grant, and has been named a fellow at the Huntington Library for her work, <laughs> I love this, on radionuclide contamination in Simi Valley, California. Welcome, Easter. Thank you so much for being here. And Jen Silverman is a New York-based writer and playwright. Her plays have been produced off-Broadway, across the United States, and internationally in the UK, Australia, Spain, the Czech Republic, China, and elsewhere. Jen is the author of The Island Dwellers, a collection of interlinked stories published by Random House and long listed for the 2019 Penn America Literary Awards. Her debut novel, We Play Ourselves, was recently published by Random House, featured in the New York Times, and I love this, selected by O Magazine as an LGBTQ book that will change the literary landscape. Her work has appeared in Vogue, The Paris Review, Plowshares, and Lit Hub, among others. Jen also writes for television and film. Welcome to both of you. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much, Tiffany. I'm so excited to be here with you and Jen. I love both these books. I love, I want to start a little bit by talking about sort of the theme of this panel, which is the special mirrors, art as a mirror of life. Um, both of these stories feature art and artists. Both of them have protagonists in creative fields that are very close to your own. Um, Jen, you're a play, actually you're both playwrights. Ixta, you're also an art critic, which is a big part of your story. Can you tell us about, each of you, can you tell us a little bit about the book in your own words and how some of your own artistic experiences in your career shaped this book? Oh, sorry, <laughs> Ixta, do you want to start? Great, thank you, thank you so much for that question. So. Um, uh, Art is Everything had its initiation in um, uh, my life as an art critic. I started writing it at, almost at the same time that I started writing art criticism for uh, magazines. And it comes after about a nine year hiatus from any creative writing during which I was doing a lot of work on social media, just doing a lot of writing on social media as a way to express myself. And so, um, uh, I write about a character who has to stop making art for a while, in part because of uh, sexual assault and um, familial loss. And uh, she goes through a rapid transformation in her life. She loses the love of her life, who abandons her. And uh, she begins to do art criticism through social media posts. So um, there was some parallel in my own life. Um, and uh, I was able to channel all of that into this uh, really kinetic uh, character uh, who uh, is, is constantly trying to make art but finds a lot of the avenues shut to her. And that's why uh, she makes art in any, in any setting that she can make it in. So art is for her everything. It's a way of living. So that's, that's the book. 
I can't. Tiffany, so I can't. I can't hear you, Tiffany. Sorry, I think I muted myself, so I didn't have feedback. Are we back? Cool, cool, cool. I love the way you tell the story. You you were just talking about the fact that you were doing a lot of social media posting, and this story is told through Google searches, histories, and uh, Yelp reviews, and Wikipedia entries, and some social media stuff I never even heard of. Uh, how much of that was born out of your own experience? Uh, like I know some of these were previously published that were actually pieces of art criticism you were writing, but then you you use it to sort of show, I love how you tie in so much of the criticisms of the artists that you're talking about with the journey Amanda is on. Can you talk a little bit about that? So um, there are two things I think you're talking about. One is whether I was doing art criticism on social media and the other is just the general relationship between art criticism and my book. I, I was posting a lot when I and I felt like I didn't have any uh, outlets to uh, publish in um, that I just had reached a dry point and so I was just I think a lot of people do this a lot of us move to social media to to write and to post pictures and to show off our art um, and but simultaneously I was uh, also starting to make inroads into uh, writing art criticism for magazines which I couldn't believe that they wanted my stuff, but I, you know, I reached out and I started writing for them. And uh, both of those things circulated back uh, into the book. And uh, my development as an art critic um, turns out to be uh, parallel to the development of uh, this protagonist, Amanda Ruiz, who becomes an arts writer uh, when she finds that uh, her life as a performance artist has come seemingly to a close. Why did you decide to tell the story in that way, almost exclusively through these types of posts and um, her her search histories and that kind of thing? Uh, because she she really does slip on the big banana peel of life. I mean, she goes through a, a midlife uh, crisis uh, that, you know, that, that's kind of such a cliche, but she does go through a midlife experience where um, her former success. And I think Jen, Jen's work is also so interesting in this regard as well. Uh, when you uh, encounter these obstacles and you don't really know how to pivot, you don't know how to transform, and it's such mm -hmm. a struggle. And so it's really her lunging at any kind of uh, outlet that she can get her hands on so that she can start to put together these ideas, uh, which are also so fractured and fragmented because she's in grief. Uh, and she's also dealing with poverty, uh, which is in so, in so many ways, uh, the it can be the life of the artist. So <laughs> the fragmented nature of social media uh, is actually, um, uh, it kind of mirrors, um, our subject is mirrors, but it does, it also kind of mirrors the, the fractured psychological self uh, under uh, trauma or uh, in conditions of stress. Uh, so there is not one coherent, linear narrative that, that we're telling on social media right. and that is necessarily being told in this novel. Um, so all those things were being reflected in the book. Jen, um, yours is told more straightforwardly, which I thought was very interesting because you do have uh, in your plays, I know that uh, your protagonist, Cass, is an absurdist playwright and I've been reading a lot about your plays and you, you also play with the form a lot and yet you wrote a straightforward narrative for the novel, and this is a first novel for you. Can you talk, tell us a little bit about what the book is about and how it was shaped? Yeah, um, well, before I talk about my book, the other thing I wanna say really quickly about Art is Everything is that it is wickedly, wickedly funny. It is such a funny yeah. book. They both are, both your books are hilarious. Thank you, and I just, I couldn't be more a fan of We Play Ourselves. We Play Ourselves by <laughs> Jen Silverman, so, so spectacular. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, we Play Ourselves is, it follows a playwright, as you mentioned, Cass, who in, is in the wake of the sort of wildly humiliating public scandal. And when we first meet her, she has fled New York to sort of rebuild her life in L.A. Um, and in L.A., she meets her next door neighbor, who's a charismatic uh, filmmaker who's making this movie with a, with a group of teenage girls, like um, a repurposing of Fight Club. And Cass sort of falls in with them um, in hopes that this will be a chance for her to sort of rebuild her life, stage a comeback, transform herself away from uh, this the scandal that has occurred that she has catalyzed. And, and then that sends her on this journey um, of really grappling with 
uh, failure and success and ambition and, and the really ugly sides of those things, um, as well as the hopeful sides. Um, in my own life, I mean, as you said, I'm a playwright as well um, as, as a writer who works in other media. Um, and writing, I mean, there was something for me really um, rich in exploring the terrain of the American theater, uh, where I've worked for <laughs> over a decade now. Um, but, and also, you know, Cass flees to LA in an attempt to rebuild. I started writing the novel the same week that I had moved to LA um, in slightly different circumstances. I was starting a TV job, but I had never lived in LA before. And so <laughs> writing a character who is in such a moment of dislocation and disorientation became, I think, a really, um, a really helpful way for me to sort of begin to tether myself and to sort of understand. I mean, LA is like the light is different. The plant life is different. <laughs> it's just, I love it now and now I'm used to it, but it is such an alien planet, particularly if you've never really spent time there. Um, and so in, in her navigations of New York and LA, I was for different reasons, but, um, with a similarly personal connection, exploring my relationship to those cities as well. I thought it was interesting too, that it seemed to affect, um, I don't know if it affected Cass's art so much, but her perception of art to me felt different from New York to LA. Does the, was that a conscious thing for you? Does the um, environment the artist is in to you affect the artwork? Because she's doing these very kind of rich exploratory, um, I hate to use the word important because it sounds ridiculous, but thought provoking and important plays about the human condition. And then she comes to LA and it's this, like you said, it's sort of a fight club meets reality TV, slightly exploiting <laughs> young girls. It felt very New York and LA to me. Was that intentional? I think some of that is about the journey that Cass is on where she gets a taste in New York. She gets a taste of fame and acclaim like, before her play comes out, there's a sense of like, this might be, you know, the way that people get sort of put on a pedestal or anointed, like this might be the next voice of her generation. And then the play is too weird and it gets panned. Um, and, and then LA becomes, okay, well, if I need, if I'm looking for, you know, a commercial vehicle to the stars, what is the thing that I can attach myself to? Um, so some of that I think is about the character's journey. I mean, I know of course that there are these, um, sort of archetypes around it. like New York is the place where heady intellectual work gets made and LA is the place where sort of broad mass appeal. Like, but I actually, my experience of both those cities is not so cut and dry. And there is like a pretty um, active and rich and nuanced theatrical landscape in LA as well. Like there are really amazing theaters doing work there. Which you also present later in the book. Right, right. She goes to the Geffen, which is one of my favorite theaters. Right. <laughs> So I love that your both of your books share this idea of an artist who is uh, at the top of her game and receiving a lot of acclaim and a lot of attention, who then loses that. Mm -hmm. um, so I have two questions about that, I guess, and y'all can take whichever prong of it is interesting. One, and I always hate to say how much of that is reflective of your personal experience, but in this panel, I feel like we're allowed to ask that question since that's kind of what it's about. So I am wondering about that because, for example, Jen, uh, American Theater Magazine called 2016 the year of Silverman, <laughs> which felt very similar to me to cast being so widely hailed. And Amanda is having so much career success and she's had these fellowships and grants she's really proud of. And then they lose that. And they seem to sort of lose their identity as people. Can you talk a little bit about the intersection of the, I guess, the artist and the person and the role of perception and acclaim in how, in, in their art and how they perceive themselves? So it's really easy to get seduced and uh, to think that um, if you've had some success early, that this is how, this is going to be your trajectory and it's going to be Philip Roth all day and all night and you're a star and um but the question is how uh, as a woman artist can you have stamina hmm. how can you persist and it's not necessarily um courting the market it's not necessarily um trying to uh 
stay within the category for which you've been lauded. And it's that, that growth as an artist that's uh, so uh, difficult to maintain, particularly uh, when uh, you really start to feel what the costs of being an artist truly are. Um, there's a there's a significant downside and you need to support yourself and, during periods where no one else is going to support you and and I'm not and, and it's the same thing I'm in ever in any career in any calling um, there's nothing particularly special in my mind about being an artist that's a myth that we've developed and has some damaging aspects to it but I also think that that myth is something that my character at least has integrated into her life and is now trying to figure out how to how to create a full life um, uh, and to make art uh, without necessarily the kind of support that she had when she was younger. And I definitely experienced that. Um, I experienced lots of other things too, but um, uh, yeah, so when you get knocked down, how do you get back up? How do you get back up? How do you keep doing it? Um, should you keep doing it? And I think that that's a really important question. There's, mm. there's a, particularly the, the story of women of color artists is the story of initial output and then silence. I mean, if we think about Zora Neale Hurston and the way she couldn't get her work published at the end of her life and uh, so many other uh, artists. Rosa Rolanda is this amazing Mexican painter, Mexican American painter. She was actually uh, brought up here in Southern California and then she moved to Mexico. Um, uh, where she studied as a photographer um, and then became a painter. Uh, she uh, kind of went under at the age of 62. She just stopped uh, making art and there's been no um, reckoning uh, for her career really. She's very little known. Um, you have to really scavenge for her, but once you do, you find a lot. So I wanted to tell these stories about what, what it means to be a, truly a failure. Um, uh, it's such a painful thing. And then, uh, how do you how do you come out of that? Yeah, that what you're saying feels so important because, and is very much connected, sort of my thinking around it as well. Because particularly when you're a young artist, um, but even when you're not, perceived success, whether that's critical success or ticket sales or book sales or whatever that number is, that numerical assessment, is tied to the future permission that you require to do your work, right? Yeah. Future access to space, to publishers, to what you know, whatever it is. And so it is really hard, I think, particularly for artists who are newer to the field, um, whether they start later or they're younger or whatever that reason is, it, it's hard initially to separate um, <laughs> externally perceived success from their own worth because you're being told either you get to make more work or you don't get to make more work right um, and that's something that has really been a learning curve for me around understanding that ultimately i i want to make the work that i want to make and some of that work will be approved and gatekeepers will say great move on to the next step and some of that work will not be and i still want to make that work and i'm entirely uninterested in only making you know what is somehow in sync with the zeitgeist or that particularly the american zeitgeist because i feel like in some ways there's such a specific cultural conversation here around what um is perceived as as economically viable you know yeah. like even just in terms of theater there's amazing experimental boundary pushing work that's happening in the UK in Germany in you know in Latin America like there's a lot of places um, that, that perhaps we have yet to catch up to not in terms of that work not happening here but in terms of that work being supported here yeah um, right so right. I think that I have I've really grappled with um, the questions of how to be really concrete and certain and what I want to make and how that certainty um, needs to remain unaffected by the way that that work then lands, which is not to say you can't pay attention to the conversations happening around the work. Um, you know, and at this point I've become somebody who does read reviews by a certain small group of critics who they don't always like my work, but I find them really interesting and I find their responses really informative. So I think you can keep an eye to the outside world but but not if that certainty isn't in place because it's so easy to be knocked off balance. You have that character Helene who seems like such an if I'm pronouncing her name correctly, 
yeah, uh, who is such an anchor uh, in the book uh, because she knows the landscape and uh, she has been able to, to maintain her life as an artist. She knows she, you shouldn't sabotage yourself and she knows about mm -hmm. the story of permission that you're describing. Um, and she was just such a fascinating character, such an inspiring character, I thought. Is that based, I'm sorry, if it's okay, Tiffany, for me to ask this question? Please, no. Uh, and if I can just interrupt really quickly to just sort of orient uh, people who may not have read the story yet, Helen is the director of Cass's big breakout, supposed to be big breakout play. And she's a much yeah. more experienced artist who's who's sort of guiding Cass. So, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so is it, were you projecting your future self into this uh, character? Were you uh, drawing uh, inspiration from uh, icons or or just she's a figure out of your imagination? I think, I mean, she's definitely a fictional figure, but but is influenced by a variety of people that I know who sort of have been in the field longer and who are, you know, have found ways to make a, both to balance the making a living with the making of art. Mm -hmm. um, although I don't know anyone who I could point to and say that's Helen, um, right. but something that really interests me about Helen and why I wanted to include her is that, yes, she has this wisdom. She's in her mid fifties. She's made a career um, as a director, a female director in a landscape that has, is still, but for a long time was almost entirely male nominated. And so there's some, there's a way in which she has this um, perspective that she can offer, but also that perspective is built on compromise, that she understands the ways in which she has been perceived. And so she says to Cass early on, you know, Cass is having these interviews before her play opens and she's talking openly about being queer and she's talking, you know, about being a woman and people want to ask her about her ex-girlfriends in a way that's like a bit salacious and exciting. And Cass is very willing to go down that road. And Helen says to her, like, you can't do that. You can't talk about your girlfriends. You can't talk about your body. You can't talk about your sex life because you will never be taken seriously if people see you as a female writer. They have to just see you as a writer. And Cass says, well, I don't, I am a woman and I'm queer. And so what? Like, you know, like that's, and, and Helen has a sense this, which is built in what was that, you know, there's a world that you want to live in, but that's not necessarily the world that you're in. So you need, if you operate within the parameters of the world that you're in, you can succeed. Um, but, but to sort of operate as if you're in a different world, you won't get what you want to which, you know, Cass and everybody in the generation under me sort of says, well, how do you get to the world that you want to be? in if you aren't acting as if you're there. So there is, you know, even though Helen is a figure of wisdom in some ways, I'm also interested in that intergenerational right. push and pull, both in the artistic community and outside of it, um, of, of what the women 20 years ahead of me have had to do to make their career and, and how much those things apply to my life and how much they shouldn't, um, which is an open question, I think. Can we talk a little bit more about women in art? You both write about that. You both write about the additional challenges that women face in art. Can you talk a little bit about what those are, why it's harder for women? I know, Jen, you've just talked about the fact that you can't, like this, the very same personal details that would be taken for granted as part of a man's formative years as an artist diminish you as a female artist. And Ixta, you talked about just the biological concerns of, you know, if you're a woman, there's a big part of your story about, um, is it Sochil? Am I saying the name of the character correctly? Sochi, yeah. Sochi. Sochi. Um, she is the girlfriend of Amanda, who she's wildly in love with, but loses because she does not want to take away, take time away from her art to have children. And you talk about certain specific artists who you feel their career was impacted by that. Can you both talk a little bit more about why you wanted to specifically examine the role of women in art and also queer women in art, which I think makes it more challenging? Why did I want to? Uh, so uh, I wanted to because uh, it came naturally and that's what I think about. Um, and um, she has, yeah, she struggles. She calls herself an art sociopath because sometimes it feels like to make the art, you have to sacrifice everything else. And uh, how are you going to maintain some kind of relationship and uh, make financial ends meet 
while still putting in the work necessary to uh, bring a world into existence uh, that hadn't existed before. That's, that's a tough, that's a big ask. And so she's just struggling with all of those things, uh, with becoming a mother, uh, with, uh, with uh, socializing herself in a way that she can be a good partner uh, to her beloved. Um, and uh, she finds for the first part of her career that she, that she can't do it. She can't manage both of those things at the same time. Uh, but, but she's just having a general flap. She's just flapping around. Uh, trying to do everything at the same time and and uh, is is uh it's leading her to catastrophe which turns out to be a really fertile place um where she can ultimately launch her art so that's something else that i learned that uh art is everything and uh you draw straight you can draw strength from even the worst experiences and it's uh when uh she loses hope that she i know it sounds like uh, such a classic um uh, arc, but it was mine. Uh, so, you know, I guess I'll lean on that. And uh, yeah, when uh, I mean, I found myself sitting on a sofa staring out of a window thinking you've, you've hit rock bottom, so you might as well just start writing again. Um, and which reminds me of Jen's uh, novel as well, just that kind of that mm -hmm. space of, uh, that you're, you've entered a sterile territory, uh, a frightening land of your own mind and then uh uh what is it wallace stevens after the final no there comes a yes um mm -hmm. one of the most beautiful lines in american poetry uh after the final no there came a yes uh for me and for my character and i and uh uh yeah i have to really hang on to that in a lot of ways it feels like those challenges though are what create both of your characters into how they evolve as artists. Is that necessary to artists? I mean, is that how you artists have to suffer, I guess? Right. Uh, I know. I would just laugh hysterically. I was like, I, oh, I suffered for my art. And I would just laugh like until tears came because it was such a cliche <laughs> and it was just happening to me so hard. And, uh, uh, you know, ultimately, like, I'm able to tell a nice, nice Disney story about it. Like, oh, and I can um, but I don't know. I think, you know, I look at some of these uh, other artists I, uh, who, uh, like Updike, seem to be able to maintain, like, wives and mistresses, and he had some nice <laughs> house upstate New York, and blah, and uh, he seemed fine. You know, he wasn't suffering. Uh, he's a painter and a, you know, New York New Yorker writer, and he seemed to be all good. Uh, so I don't know. I don't think that you do have to suffer. I just think it's just world that we live in that that makes it so and so you create it becomes uh the substance of, for your art if you find yourself going through that but now it's not necessary yeah i think that's exactly jen right. i sort of skipped okay. i know sorry go ahead we, we moved to another question which i want to hear your answer to but i also want to go back to the women one because i you write so much so well about that as well oh wait sorry i think there's a brief delay though you want me to talk about the women one or no i'm I don't want to, we skipped over that one, so I do want to go back to it, but I also, I, I love your take on what we were just talking about with art and suffering. Oh, I mean, I, I think that Ix is absolutely right that you don't need to suffer to be an artist, but if you are suffering, art is really the only outlet I have ever found to make any not even meaning, but understanding of what is happening. The mm -hmm. understanding of what got you there, what is happening to you there, and where you might go from there. I mean, art is a kind of both backward-facing conscience and forward-facing imagination. Um, but I think wow. I think if people, if people are making art and they're not suffering, then call me and tell me how to do it, please. <laughs> <laughs> That's part of what it seems to me, both of you, your characters evolve you both mentioned the young artist versus the mature artist and not only do we see both women i guess grow up a bit but their their art evolves along with them in the course of it and the way they define art evolves particularly i'm thinking about Cass's. i don't want to sort of give anything away but Cass comes to pursue a really different medium <laughs> and venue that she realizes is still art. And then in Amanda's case, Ixta, she wanted to be a performance artist. And then she finds that the writing about art she's been doing is also art. Mm -hmm. 
how much of of maturing as an artist is redefining your understanding of your work? So, um, uh, briefly, I, I think it's the it's the uh, human project. Uh, you, you don't stay the same; it'll be stays the same. We're always becoming, and so um, that transformation is ultimately going to happen, whether you want it to or not. And uh, so, um, I think in, in both of Jen's and mine's cases, in terms of uh, the works that we've produced that we're talking about today. There's been uh, this transformation in the life that that is then reflected in transformation in the arts and uh, performance art was such an inspiration to me because uh, performance artists were able to make art out of uh, what seemed to be nothing. Uh, so, for example, um, I encountered uh, this artist named Lindsay Tunkel at the Hammer Museum. Uh, many now years ago she now goes by the name scarlet tunkel but at the time her name was lindsay tunkel and uh she uh had set up a kind of kiosk at the hammer where she was selling uh tarot cards based on the apocalypse and i just found this woman so fascinating that i started looking her up and she has all these videos on vimeo and uh one showed her she's a uh, beautiful woman she's large bodied and she has this uh, dark hair and she's wearing a blue dress and she's sitting in the middle of a white room and uh, standing before a table upon which a, a white table upon which a white bowl is situated and the bowl is full of water and so she would start to sing the Whitney Houston hit I will always love you right the Dolly Parton Whitney Houston hit and then periodically smash her head under the water and drown herself and then come back up and then keep doing it and then drown herself again. So, you know, like, like you do. And then, uh, <laughs> you know, and I was like, this is the best thing I've ever seen in my life. And it was a form of endurance art, which is a brand of performance art, uh, maybe initiated by Joseph Hoyps, but also very famously Marina Abramovich, um, the Yugoslav. Uh, and, uh, she, uh, I, I just thought this is a person who, who knows what the deal is. And uh, uh, I, I totally get this, drowning yourself while singing I Will Always Love You. And, and I started writing a piece about her uh, because uh, I, thought she was, I thought she was right. So, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but at least now you guys know about Lindsay Tarkle. <laughs> um, and I'm sorry, Jen, we, I keep getting distracted. I want to come and uh, focus on one question with you, but I, I have to follow up on this. Lindsay Tunkel. Um, that was one of the more memorable parts of the book. And you also have pictures so that in case we can't picture it, we can actually see Lindsay drowning herself in the water. I love that you you really explore what the definition of art is. You have another um, character or another uh, piece of art that you talk about where she's talking about fascism. I don't want to get too specific here, but she's making a very personal statement with her own body to make a statement about fascism. Where do you find all these artists? First of all, I know some of them are more well known. Which, which, what are we talking about with the fascism body thing? Hang on. I can get the name. I should know. Um, it's not Agnes. Uh, I mean, I'm very into fascism and body love. Like, you know, that's kind of how we I don't want to scroll. I'm going to, I'll come back to find that one. So how, do, so you're asking, how do I find these artists? Yeah. How do you find these artists? So, I um, know you said you ran into. Uh, and then, and then I'll turn to Jen. Um, uh, uh, I love going to galleries and I love going to museums and I love going to performances and I uh, I just uh, and I do a lot of research I'm I just I'm constantly trying to learn about art as well as other things like science and um, I, it's just uh, maintaining a practice of uh, going to museums going to galleries and reading that I have found uh, all these artists whom uh, Claude Cahoon, for example, another artist who's who's so important, who I had not really known about until about five years ago, but who's a titanic figure in 20th century art, and who uh, fought the Nazis with conceptual art. And she was a 
a, a queer woman or a, a trans, maybe a trans person, avant la lettre, which means before uh, we had language for that. Uh, and she, why, why are we studying Picasso? Like Claude Cahoon is the person that we should all know about. Um, and so it's just my, my tremendous love uh, for these artists. I just can't get enough of them. Just, it's just that hunger that, that leads me to find them. That comes through. Jen, I have like three questions that I did not get to uh, delve into further with you. Do you want to tell me which of those you had a great answer for that I, I'm sorry we got distracted on a tangent? Uh, we talked about women in art. We talked about, um, I, did you have something about, because that was three questions ago, but we were talking about the role of women in art and how they are more marginalized and face more challenges. And I know you had some things to say about that, but did I skip over anything you wanted to add to that? No, okay. I think so. um, one of the things you do in your book that I love is have a nemesis. <laughs> um, Cass has Tara Jean Slater, who has achieved everything that she wants to. I think this ties in a little bit with art and perception we were talking about. How much that influences her profoundly, both negatively and positively, um, to the point where she actually seems to become one of her biggest fans. Can you talk a little bit about, um, I guess, the uh, Tara Jean Slater as a character and putting herself in her own art and how at first that that really seems almost repellent to Cass and then little by little she discovers that this art is much more powerful than she realized at first. Yeah, well, Tara Jean Slater is so as you said, she's Cass's nemesis. She Cass is 33, Tara Jean is 21. And at 21, Tara Jean has not yet graduated from Yale and she has achieved everything that Cass has ever wanted to achieve. Like all in terms of public outward accolades, success, awards, commissions, productions, everything that Cass longs for, Tara Jean has done and, and seemingly done effortlessly. Um, and when we meet Tara Jean, I'm trying to think how to avoid spoilers, but um, some of what Cass is reacting to, in addition to her own sort of devouring envy, is the fact that, you know, and I think I, as a blanket statement, I would say um, there used to be a time where nobody was interested in stories by or about young women. And then there became a time where those stories were um, commercially quite viable if they revolved around a, like personal trauma, that trauma is very sellable, female trauma is extremely sellable, and Tara Jean is sort of exercising her trauma in the pieces that she's making, um, and and exercising her trauma such that she's even like reenacting some of this trauma, and and of course the sort of the art world is going wild for it, and 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 she's being elevated in a way um, that that Cass longs for. But also Tara Jean is making the work she needs to make, and she's not necessarily making it for um, a commercial machine, and she can't really help that what she's making is sort of intensely aligned with what people think they can sell. That's just one of the realities in which she's operating. Um, and But so sort of through the examination of, of Cass's relationship to Tara Jean and, and both of their relationships to the marketplace, I wanted to think about um, both sort of the the courage and vulnerability and risk that is required for you to expose yourself publicly in various ways, you know, to, to expose your trauma or to exercise your demons or to make the work that takes you to sort of the darkest parts of your play yourself. Um, but also the commodification of identity and that mm -hmm. Tara Jean's identity is, is sort of across the course of the book being more and more commodified. Um, and she is sort of, I mean, she's in charge of it, but but there's a sense of like, will you always be in charge of it? Um, and, and Cass, in a way, I think, begins to, as she being differently, of course, she begins to understand herself differently because the thing about um, the idea of a nemesis, which interests me so much, is you project onto somebody else all of your aspirations and your desires and the ways in which you are afraid that you're falling short or the things that you wish you had claim to in some way, you know. And so by learning about Tara Jean, ultimately Cass is learning about herself. 
Tara Jean actually seems made somewhat miserable by putting herself in her art. You know what I mean? And and Cass's journey seems to me to be but in both books, I think, there is a an element of each character trying to define who she is not independently of her art, but I guess in exist in coexistence with her art. Tara Jean kind of exemplifies that because she's literally, she is her art. She's putting herself in it and it makes her miserable. And it seems to me that both your protagonists, part of their journey is realizing that there is art and then there's life and they are intertwined, but they're not, they don't exclusively define each other. Was that part of what you set out to tell? Or is that part of the realization of becoming a mature artist? That's I think that's a a, a line that you're that you're usually navigating. Um, oh, my character Amanda. So Joseph Boys is a performance artist uh, who worked in the mid twentieth century, and uh, for him everything would, would be integrated, it seemed to me, would be integrated into his art practice, although it must be said that it has to be a, a fiction that he uh, portrayed for the world because he also had a wife and two children whom we almost never heard about uh, and who I had to sort of dig around to find. But uh, he would definitely, uh, as in the case of uh, uh, Jen's uh, nemesis character that she's talking about, um, uh, he made everything, uh, uh, seemed to make everything about his life into his art. So one of his most uh, famous uh, projects was, oh, 1974, uh, this uh, work called uh, I Like America and America Likes Me, where he, he traveled uh, from Germany uh, to uh, New York, New York's uh, uh, Raymond Block Gallery, I believe is the name of the gallery, uh, and he was wearing uh, sort of a blanket uh, the entire time, and he wouldn't look out of, when he was on the plane. He wouldn't look at anything until he got to the gallery because he didn't. I don't know why that was his thing. And then he shows up, and his assistants have somehow captured in the wild a, a coyote, and they have put Wall Street Journal newspapers all over the floor of the gallery so that uh, the coyote can pee on capitalism. And then uh, Joseph Boys is uh, like being a shaman uh, for a, a week with this um, uh, coyote by banging on this little triangle and doing these dances while he's wearing the blanket and uh, sort of showing these pictures of a triangle uh, based on some kind of mystical uh, and also racist philosophy. And he thought that he was healing the red man, to him, which to him was the phrase for uh, Native Americans, and uh, he was going to heal the American genocide, and he was just going bananas, and uh, really, uh, and at, at the end, he was just kind of throwing his gloves for the coyote, who was fetching them and giving them back to him like a puppy dog, and uh, that, and Joseph was just like, voila, like, so good, such good art, this is me. <laughs> And um, I think that the real art in it was that he was caring for this coyote and he was learning what the coyote wanted and all this stuff about triangles and this racist, weird, like, healing the red man thing. It was a bunch of nonsense. Um, but uh, he at least created this, uh, he helped create this uh, myth of the artist as being as one uh, with his art. Um, uh, but... Um, yeah, so my my character that I don't think she resolves that for herself. She and it's a it's a she's constantly working on it, but she does wind up having a child, and so and so um, but she doesn't want to turn her child into uh, an art uh, project. Um, but if I might uh, briefly, uh, Jen, you know your um, uh, characters, your this nemesis relationship in your novel, it it makes me wonder about uh, zero sum gameism in the art world that mm -hmm. if they have it, then I can't have it. And if like, particularly women, and if I have it, then uh, they can't have it. And uh, I found that just so painful. And uh, it also resonated with me about uh, this scarcity market, this scarcity uh, within the art market that uh, creates so much terror. And uh, I think uh, is so um, suppressive 
of uh, and not generative of of the art uh, instinct. I, and I just thought it was so great that you wrote about that. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I think I mean the scarcity is absolutely the word, and I think I mean there's a larger conversation to be had around it. But it, you know, specifically in this country where the arts are so underfunded or in some in many places not funded, there is sort of immediately a scarcity that's created. And for the longest time, you know, in the theater world, stories by and about, for the most part, straight white men were considered universal. And so like any, you know, an audience would buy tickets to a universal story, they would see themselves and reflected back in some way. Whereas, you know, stories by or plays by, you know, women and artists of color and queer artists, that was a risk. And so you would have maybe like, one slot for the risk, you know, because economically speaking, the theater can't go under, and then you would program the universal season. And the sort of really unfortunate and toxic result of that is exactly what you're saying, that the people who are your your community, your artistic family, your friends, are suddenly being positioned as competitors. Um, and I think, you know, so much of what has become important to me about how to operate in the world is, is constantly resisting that. And if I'm in a meeting for something, there's three other artists I wanna talk about while I'm there. If somebody brings a project to me and I'm like, I don't have time, I'm not right, I'll give you a list of artists that are better for this than I am. Like the, it feels really important for us to advocate for our artistic families, you know, and sort of resist a, a structure in which we're somehow being pitted against each other, you know. Y'all both mentioned the sort of the commoditization element of it. And Tara Jean actually at one point stops pursuing her poetry because it's become commodified. Does that, so you've got this paradox, it seems like, where there is a, a finite chunk of, or finite pie to draw from because of the underfunding of the arts. But then you have artists who feel that that, that what cheapens the art or changes what the art is? What is the relationship between the monetization of art and the necessity for the monetization of art? Right. I'm, I'm, so my first book was about um, Latina gang girls in Los Angeles, and um, and it was uh, in a vernacular, and it was based in part upon the experiences of my family members and also my work in the justice system. Um, because uh, before sentencing in a federal criminal trial, there's something called the right of allocution, where you have a right to tell your story to the judge before the judge sentences you. And so I was working within that system, and I was hearing all these stories, and I knew I needed to uh, just to tell them uh, uh, in in a fictional form. And that was great, and I learned a lot, and it was also an important catharsis for me, based on personal experiences and my own. And my own family. Uh, but when I tried to branch out of that, at one point my agent said, a, a wonderful person, rest in peace, uh, who supported me to no end, but she said, I think you need to write another gang book uh, because um, this other stuff that you're doing is, is less successful. And, um, uh, and I appreciate that, right? Because the only reason why people are going to become invested in supporting your career unless they are just altruistic to an insane level, is that uh, they're gonna be working within, working uh, in a market for you. Um, but uh, I, that didn't, that's, that wasn't where I needed, that wasn't gonna happen for me. It wasn't, it wasn't gonna generate what I needed to, to do. And so um, uh, the commodification of art can, um, can be problematic if it's, if it's stunting you if it's stunting you and keeping you from saying things that some people do need to hear, even if it's not everybody needs to hear it. Some people may, may need to hear it. You deal directly with that, Jen, in the way that Cass takes on a role in Caroline's film, which is really about commodification. And she at first really embraces that and then begins to have second thoughts about that. Do you have thoughts about what we were just talking about? Yeah, I mean, well, in, in the case of Cass, I, I, with this is, there are spoilers, this is not one. Carolyn, you know, say, is somebody who has a very canny and cold grasp of the marketplace. She says, mm -hmm. 
finds out Cass is queer, she says, oh, okay, great. So you're going to be the queer artist and we're going to do a scene where you sit down with this teenager who's also queer and she's going to tell you, you know, that she's scared that she's gay and we'll do a coming out scene. And Cass says, read the teenager, like she's, she's out, she's been out, like she's not scared of coming out. Like, well, how, well, how are we enact, reenacting the sort of like 1980s, like shameful coming out moment? Like that's not where we're, you know, she's, 17 she's like part of a generation that's had language for this and they were in kindergarten but but carolyn says no 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 this is what the marketplace wants and and cass is sort of seduced by the idea that if you perform a thing that people want in a certain way you know it, and you are almost like by commodifying yourself you know you are perhaps in charge of the way that the marketplace works and and as as things play out and start to escalate and as the choices that Carolyn is asking the girls to make and that the girls are making become sort of more and more um, actively troubling, then I think Cass starts to really have to ask, are you in charge of the machine if you are doing what the machine wants you to do? Or are you just, you know, doing what the machine wants you to do? Like, like how much, how in charge can you be when you start actively um, participating in sort of inauthentic enactments of your identity. And I mean, the book, the title is We Play Ourselves. Like for me, a lot of the examinations within that book are the ways in which we perform ourselves, not only sort of in terms of courting a kind of success or ambition, but also how we can get lost in those performances. And that if you are, mm -hmm. um, if you perform a version of yourself long enough, what happens when you've spent more time as the version than as whatever's underneath the version? Like, do you sort of become the version or is it still a performance? Um, and I think those questions of, of self-performance are definitely tied for me to a conversation about sort of capitalism and commodification, but also are tied to um, just the question of like, how do we ever find the boundary between the selves we enact and the self that we are perhaps protecting by putting an enactment over it, you know, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure we get, sorry, go ahead, Ixta. No, just that old saying that the mask eats the face. Uh, that, <laughs> yeah, that you, uh, it's, yeah, Jen's work is a, kind of ex existentialist, if you don't mind that. Uh, word. It's about, yeah, it's about uh, this uh, struggle to become uh, and not to have the self imposed upon you uh, through uh, these roles that we're forced to play. So it's about, it is definitely about capitalism, but that might, I think that's something that the ancients were worrying about. I think Sophocles mm -hmm. was more worrying about that. So such great work. Well, it's hard to separate pure art from from where it's intended to go and what and how it remunerates the artist and how people perceive it and how that changes it. And I love that you guys, both of your books, explore all those facets of art, not just how capitalism or being paid for your art or how so you can support yourself as an artist affects you as an artist, but also how the way people perceive your art affects you as an artist. I love that both of your characters are on that journey. Um, I can talk about this all day with you both. You're so fascinating. But I want to make sure we do get uh, one question from GK who asks, when writing about real people in a fictional book, are there any legalities you need to think about beforehand and where do you draw the line with modifying or fictionalizing their stories to fit your narrative? Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, except for, well, I, I did, I wrote about a few um, uh, living artists, uh, um, Glenn Ligon, uh, the curator and genius Thelma Golden, uh, Lindsay Tunkel, who whom I've already uh, spoken of, and my memory fails me, but by and large, I was writing about historical figures. But I didn't, I didn't, as far, I didn't fictionalize their lives. I uh, operated off of documented um, uh, sources, document, you know, documents about their lives, and I, I just kind of, it was more reporting. Um, in, uh, Tiffany was nice enough to mention another book of mine called uh, A Book of Short Stories, um, The World Doesn't Work That Way, But It Could. That is where I did uh, struggle uh, with anxiety uh, over writing about real people. I wrote about 
former EPA head, Scott Pruitt, and his mm. uh, unraveling of the uh, Environmental Protection Agency. Um, but I felt like at that moment, the moment when I was writing that, I felt like the world was coming to the United States and also just the global climate catastrophe was coming to such a crisis that um, I didn't care. And uh, I wrote I wrote about him in a fictionalized uh, way that kind of brought together uh, his a uh, level of uh, malice, negligence, and destructiveness. And I uh, I just I felt like I had to. And um, uh, but and it's it's been fine. <laughs> it's been fine. But yeah, he has fun. other he has other fires to be putting out. <laughs> he can't be bothered right now. Yeah. Did you struggle with that, Jen? I know in your in this book you don't have I don't think you don't have any real figures, but in your some of your plays I think you do. Don't you have one that uh, is either about or features Hillary Clinton? <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, you know, I for the most part I no I don't tend to sort of struggle with that. It is a lot of the work that I that I make is is definitely fictional. But with I mean with We Play Ourselves and with The Island Dwellers, which was the collection that came out before that, you know, even though it's it's fictional, of course you draw from your life, you draw from experiences, and there's always a moment in the editing process where, you know, your editor, the in-house lawyers sort of check in and say, is there anybody who could think this is them? Um, and why would they think that and and what can be changed if anything needs to be changed? Um, but I would say in answer to anyone who's sort of wondering that, like write the thing you need to write, and then you can sit down with your sort of editorial lawyers and, and mm -hmm. find out. I mean, something that I learned, you know, was that basically one of the main standards of whether something is legally viable or not is, is it defamation? So if it's true, it's not defamation. If it's unflattering, but you're not accusing somebody of something, you know, illegal um, or criminal or whatever, like then that's not defamation. So there is actually a lot of space in which to draw from your life authentically and also still not be trespassing into other people's legal territory. Uh, Maricet, Maricela asks, what do you each love about the story you've told? We'll end on that one. Maricela, what a loving question you've asked. Um, uh, what I love about uh, the story that I have told in Art is Everything is my protagonist, Amanda Ruiz, who doesn't stop. She uh, has, uh, she has unbounded energy and uh, a ferocious uh, hunger to keep making art. And um, yeah, in my life, I have not always necessarily felt like that. And um, her, her uh, ambition to, for living um, and to be alive was something that I, um, I was glad uh, bring about in literary form. So I, I really, I found her something to live up to. Mm -hmm. I think I mean, we spend so much time perhaps um, afraid of failure. And, and for me, something that I loved being able to do was to look at what is on the other side of failure. And, and that we begin with a character who has failed disastrously. She's failed personally. She's failed professionally. She has failed inside of her relationships. Um, she's failed spiritually in some ways. And, and that by being able to begin in a place of such utter catastrophic failure, um, I could ask myself really generative questions about you know, and then what? And so what? And what is failure? And what? How do you repurpose or regenerate your spirit when it's been broken? Um, and that was a journey that I both really loved being able to go on um, narratively, but also I think personally that felt really useful. So, mm. no, that's a great answer to end on. Thanks. I want to remind everybody that both these books and all the books at the festival are available through the Nowhere Bookshop on the book buy link just below or on the uh, San Antonio Book Festival website link. Ixta, Jen, I can't thank you both enough. You have written beautiful books, not just about art and what it means to be an artist, but what it means to be a human being. And they're both so, we didn't get to talk about the humor, but they're both just riotously funny and touching and real and beautifully written. Thank you both. Thanks for being here. Thank you all. Thank you, Tiffany. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, everybody who came. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you. This was so lovely to be in conversation with you. And, and thank you so much for coming to see this.
hopefully in person next time. Enjoy the rest of the festival, everybody. Thank you.